contemplation before chanting. The Sangha is invited to come back to our breathing so that our collective energy of mindfulness will bring us together as an organism, going as a river with no more separation. Let the whole Sangha breathe as one body, chant as one body, listen as one body, and transcend the boundaries of a delusive self, liberating ourselves from the superiority complex, the inferiority complex, and the equality complex.
perched on her Dharma nest. She sees near and far children of the present moment, and she invites them to come on stage. Please follow me. Today I'm going to need all of your help because I have a very important announcement to make. Can you help me? Sure. Okay, let's see. Yes. Did you throw my back to your eggs? My eggs? <laughs> do you want to be eggs? Yes, I'm a chicken, but you can do the chicks. <laughs> the little chickadees and chickadoos, right? <laughs> I'm going to need everybody's help because we have a very important, important announcement to make. And all the kids can come because this is something that is very crucial because sometimes we have the prince, prin the little prince. The crown too big? So, I'm going to need a microphone for all of you, and I'm going to ask you to help me declare a very special day today. But in order to do that, I need everybody's participation and mindfulness and awareness because we're all children of the present moment, even myself. Okay? So, what are we going to say? You're going to say where you're from, your name and where you're from, what state, if you are. And then you're going to declare a day. And we're going to declare today is today's day. Do you know what today's day is? Huh? August 20th. Today? August 20th. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the 20th. I haven't checked. <laughs> but today's day is a very important day because you can't live in yesterday's day. Can you live in yesterday? <laughs> Technically, you've already lived yesterday. And, and then, can you live tomorrow? Yeah. You hope to? Yeah. Yeah. But, but what, does, what makes tomorrow? What? Today. So then today is the most important day. Yeah. It's always the most important day. And sometimes, the adults forget that, right? How many of the adults in here forget today's the important date? You can so, <laughs> the real king. <laughs> so, I'm going to need all of you to help me declare and to remind the adults that today is today's day. Are you ready? So we're gonna do one. But The prince will bear witness to this. He's the future king. Okay, so you can say your name and where you're from, and you can declare that today is today's day. Okay, do you have a microphone? My name is Malachi. Um, I'm from Minnesota, and today is today's day. I'm Charlotte from Colorado, and today is today's day. I'm Lily, also from Colorado, and today is today's day. I'm Declan from Laramie, Wyoming, and today is today's day. Today is pacifier day. My name is Madison, and today's day is today. <laughs> okay, what about over here? Can you help me? Yeah. I'm Ivy from Colorado, and, t and today is today's day. I'm Ezra from New Hampshire, and today is today. And today is today's day. <laughs> I'm Lane, also from Colorado, and today is today's day. My name's Olivia, and I'm from Wisconsin. Today is today's day. 
My name's Keegan, I'm from Minnesota, and today's today's day. My name's Reva, I'm from Colorado, and today's today's day. Thank you. Do we have anybody else from different states? I think the governor of Colorado is gonna have a lot of pressure implicating that today is today's day. <laughs> on the calendar on August 20th <laughs> is today's day. Right, thank you for your help. And maybe you can discuss all the details of what we're going to do on today's day. But what do you think we should do? We should live today. We should go swimming. <laughs> You guys don't want to be happy? We go to the river on today's day? We should be mindful on today's day. We should eat lunch. We should, <laughs> we should eat lunch right after breakfast? Yeah. Immediately after breakfast? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's today's day for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. You, <laughs> you know, I think that's the best idea yet. I think that's the best idea yet. Yes. Um, um, today, um, we, uh, <laughs> 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 well, that beats the whole part of today's day. <laughs> you really want to? Okay, well, we can do that in four years. <laughs> okay, thank you, children. Maybe in your program today, we can discuss with the brothers and sisters there what we want to declare some more, the fine lines and the rules of today's day, and how we can water our seeds of happiness and live in the present moment, because only today's day will make tomorrow's day. Okay, thank you for your help. Thank you, children. Thank you. So you can stand up at the sound of the small bell. And then you can join your palms. And thank you, everyone, for listening and to the declaration of today's day. You, can, you may keep your crown. So dear friends, let us find a comfortable position, sitting upright. And relaxed. And let us listen deeply to three sounds of the bell. And while we listen to the sound of the bell, to let us tap into our body just to really feel where all the muscles are, the bend of our knees, our feet on the floor, our folded down to the every very small cells that run into our veins. And as we go deeper into breathing with the bell, we can tap into the feelings of the body. What is our body feeling at this moment?
respected Thai dear brothers and sisters and dear family. Today is August 20th, in the year 2024, and today is today's day. We are in the Assembly of Stars Hall in, in the YMCA of Estes Park, Colorado, during our Earth, Our True Nature retreat. I have a story that I would like to tell you. In, I think it was in 2007, I had uh, been asked to organize a retreat for Thai in Rome. And uh, it's very similar to this retreat. Mm. And I was Thai's attendant also and the organizing team. And one day, Thai had asked me to come to his room and he had a request. He said, Sister Kinyim, can you make me a business card? And I was like, why would you need a business card? <laughs> like, what business would I have to give out? <laughs> and I just sat there and I listened to him. And I'm like, okay, a business card. And he said, but I don't want anything on it. <laughs> like, no information, no email, no phone number, no fax number, nothing. And he said, no, nothing on it. I just want 100%. The 100% on my business card. And I was like, okay. It was a Sunday. And, uh, well, we know Europe doesn't function on Sundays. Everything is closed. Uh, and so I couldn't get to a print shop. And the next day was the retreat day. And so uh, I had to do everything I could search near and far to find a print shop that would print for me 1,000 business cards uh, and have it expedited within a couple of hours. And that's almost impossible. But it happened. It happened. And I was able to obtain 1,000 business cards with just a simple 100% on it. Nothing else. And I presented these boxes of business cards to Tai, and Tai said, I want to have my seal on this card. <laughs> so, Mr. Mindfulness himself was asking me to put his seal on every single business card. It was nerve wracking because he's watching me drinking tea calmly <laughs> and watching my every single press of every single card. And it has to be like very squared right into like fitting to the right corner of the business card and specifically the lower right corner. And he just enjoyed watching tea and I was sweating under my robes just pressing down 1,000 times. It's harder than a bench press, I promise you that, because your teacher is watching you. And uh, I thought that was done, you know, like, okay. So I did it, and he helped me lay it all out on the uh, table so the ink to dry, his, his red ink to dry. And then, uh, so it became my meditation, just really being aware of every single press. Because it's not, it's, I'm also doing this on behalf of Thai. After I finished that, you know, normally when we go on tour with Thai, he gives us a couple of days to, you know, look, um, to see the sights, so to speak. Uh, because Rome is a very beautiful city. Uh, it has a lot of culture and history, also a lot of pain and uh, suffering. And so the brothers and sisters uh, had a sightseeing day. And what Tai had asked me, <coughs> what Tai had asked me to do is, Sister Kinyim, can you give out these bus tickets to the brothers and sisters? I was like, Tai, we chartered a bus. We didn't, weren't, we don't need a bus ticket. And he said, no, these 100% business cards are their bus tickets. And they can only get onto the bus and go sightseeing if they have it in their pocket. And so I had to pass out all of these business cards or these bus tickets 
to the brothers and sisters. And then uh, I've been to Rome many times and traveling with Thai, so I didn't have a need to go sightseeing. On top of that, I was busy with organization. And I was like on top of like every single detail right before everyone arrived. You know how much work came in when you all arrived, the pre -pre preparation before that. So I was there. But Thai said, Sister Kinyum, you're going on the trip. And I was like, darn it. <laughs> he always keeps us on our toes, Thai, and breaks up all these expectations of what we're, our plans are, a perfect teaching on impermanence. Um, and so I had to breathe and smile. <laughs> it looks like a smile when I'm actually clenching my teeth. And said, yes, hi, I will go. And he, he sent me on a mission. He said, your task is to make sure that the brothers and sisters are practicing 100%. I'm like, really, I have to be the police now? <laughs> I have to make sure everybody is practicing? Aren't they supposed to be responsible for that? And I said, yes, and then you report to me. Now I have the tattletale? <laughs> it's not an easy position to be in, you know. And so he gave me the instructions on right before the bus would take off from the, from, the, from, the, from the meeting location is that I had to get on the microphone, you know, like the flight attendants to put on your safety belt and, you know, sit and breathe. So I had to do a, a practice version of that of breathing and coming back to ourselves and listening to the bell on the bus, noble silence on the bus, um, and being 100%. And that practice of 100% is walking, no talking. And I promise you, we are so bad <laughs> at walking and talking. And the reason why is because I said, if you're practicing walking meditation, and you're talking at the same time, how mindful are you in your footsteps? And how present are you in your conversation? So that was our practice, because we can get pulled away in the excitement of the wonderful city of Rome. All the delicious gelato, mm, the pizza, the the fountains, everything, and then all the crowds of people trying to like bump in. And so we can get pulled into that so easily. So Tai gave all of us a task of being 100%, walking, no talking. But then the easy thing for me is I didn't have to put on my siren and say, you know, you're pull over. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that I had to do as the mindfulness police was just to pull out my business card and smile. Like this, as a simple reminder of <laughs> almost, a, almost a, very, a little bit passive aggressive, you want to say, <laughs> like you're not practicing. <laughs> and um, I'm joking, but not really. <laughs> and so this 100% became the practice for the brothers and sisters on that bus. And um, it was hard, it was really hard. Because every time they see me coming and a smile on my face, and I haven't pulled out the card yet, they'll be like, okay, she's coming. <laughs> but the response of Thay had asked is, if I or somebody, anyone can be the mindfulness observer, and you can pull out your card and smile, in return, if instead of justifying, oh, but it was just like this, oh, but it's just one or two words. You can also pull out your card and smile as a reminder to, to me that I can also practice walking, no talking. So one time, in the beginning, it was very difficult because we we're so used to being tourists, <laughs> sort of, uh, in a very touristy setting. And uh, my card came out quite often, almost like the yellow card in soccer. Right? Um, luckily, it only stays at yellow. It doesn't go to red. Um, and 
In the beginning, it was a joke between the brothers and sisters. I pull out my card, they pull out their card, we laugh about it, and then we continue on. But gradually, as the day grew on, it became so easy because we knew that, ah, we needed to be 100% present for ourselves, walking and investing 100% of our attention in that walking is an investment for our own well-being. And then, because we're so present within ourselves, then when we have a moment to stop and to converse with our brother and our sister, we are completely 100% there for him or for her also. And the wonderful thing is that we did this as a community. So we don't travel by ourselves. We always travel in groups. I have 40 other monastics with me, um, and it's wonderful. And when one person stops, everyone stops together to listen to each other, to share what we see. If I'm seeing, and I see a bird, and we all stop, and we enjoy that bird together. And so then the practice of tour tourism, 100% tourism, became so relaxing because we established a presence within ourselves. But there's a funny story that happened. In the very beginning, one of the, my younger brothers, I he was just smiling, <laughs> and I pulled out his ca my card, and he reached into his pocket. He reached into his pocket, and he pulled out his card. <laughs> and he covered a zero. His response is, I'll do 10% now. It's like a bargain. <laughs> I'll do a 10% to your 100%. <laughs> and it's OK. And we just sort of laughed it out. But the one important thing is that this is a transmission from Thai to be 100%. The original teachings is 100% in our footsteps, investing our whole being into each step that we take. Mm. And uh, the past couple of days, we've had the chance to do that together as a community. And then now we have a deeper practice of walking, no talking. And it doesn't mean that we're not allowed to talk. Mm. Because uh, it means that we can do one thing at a time. We have an illusion. We have an illusion that, uh, and we've been trained like this uh, since we were young. Mm, I think in uh, I'm a, I'm, I, I think I fall in the category of a, um, of a millennial monastic, mm. and so we had to do a lot of things, go into after school programs and things like that. And then we have this idea that the more that we do, the more productive we are. But in fact. It's just an illusion we use to trick ourselves because we can only do one thing at a time, but we have many different channels running at the same time. But you only have two hands. You only have one mouth. You, you, well, you can eat and talk at the same time, but then you're not chewing while you're talking. You just have food in your mouth while you're talking. Right? And so then the idea that we created that you can do multitasking and be productive is something, an illusion that people have given us. We can do a lot of things, and we can put 100% of ourselves to those things, but it's just that one thing at that moment. I can answer an email, and then when I'm done with that, my phone rings, I can pick up the phone, and I'm 100% talking to the person on the phone. What we think is we're half on the phone, or we're typing on our computer, answering the email, and we send the wrong email, the whole conversation, and accidentally send the wrong text to somebody else. How many of us have done that? Uh, yeah. I think what, what, what the king said over here, that all of you should be raising your hands. Um, but yeah, 100%. And our practice is to monotask. 
not multitask. Because when we become so divided, so divided, you know, we don't really fulfill things as much as we want to. But how does the practice of 100% come to help us heal and to transform um, the pain and the suffering that we have? This morning we had uh, mm, we had the um, guided meditation of uh, the five-year-old child, and uh, it's one of my favorite exercises. That five-year-old child inside of me, and I know that sometimes uh, that child is crying, but as adults. We're too busy. We have so many things to do. We have a whole checklist of things. I'm not there yet, but I don't know how to use this Google agenda or program things that you sort of, certain things of the day and AI or sort of taking over of what you need to do and checking things off. And we become, we feel accomplished when we have a lot of those checked off. And yet, we don't have that space inside, inside of us. So that practice of being 100%, walking, and investing all of your attention there is to slow down and to be 100% there for yourself. I, uh, during the pandemic, I had uh, the opportunity the practice of a lifetime uh, to go home and care for my parents. For the whole three years, I was at home. And if you really want to test us monastics, our resilience in our practice, put us at home. <laughs> it's easy to be in the monastery. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody should be breathing and smiling and letting go and forgiving, but you are, being pressed like in a, in a pressure cook at home all the time and you don't know how to vent it out and so you see yourself so clearly. But I had the greatest opportunity to practice being at home with my parents and it was hard, very hard. Especially because I sort of had an expectation of my space, your space. You're supposed to listen to me a little bit bossy if you would. Uh, about the practice, you know. um, quite open on other things, but you know, like you should not be eating and watching the TV, you know, <laughs> um, and those kind of things, you know, because it's not my own environment. And one of the things that I realized uh, in those years of practicing being confined, not only uh, taking care of my emotions, but their fear of what's going to happen next. I think the collective fear of everyone um, surrounding the pandemic. And, and especially for my parents, they didn't speak English. They didn't know how to navigate everything, grocery shopping online. They didn't know how to do all of that. And it was very uh, stressful for them. And I had to create my own space and also to hold them in that space. Eventually, we got along well. We had a little bit of a hiccups here and there, <laughs> big hiccups. Uh, but we were able to understand each other as we grew. And I as especially became to understanding myself and how I react to certain things. But there was one time my mother was not feeling well, and uh, I had to do a lot of things on top monastery work, on top of family work, and all the doctors, you know, our healthcare system is not really helpful, um, not really healthy. And so all the paperwork and the time and everything else that went into that, so I was sort of running thin. And I had asked my father to help prepare dinner for mom. And he just needed to you know, put, put food on the plate and just heat it up in the microwave. 
And I said, oh no, that's too much. Mom doesn't eat that much. A very simple statement on my part. Oh, mom doesn't eat that much. And she take less. And all of a sudden, my father, he just put everything down and he turned to the corner of the kitchen and he held his head down low. And he said, you always tell me what to do. And I was like, what is this? And he just, and at that moment, I saw my father's five-year-old child in the corner, in almost as if he was being punished. And I was like, what? Where did this come from? And I said, OK. It's OK, Daddy. If you're not ready, then I, I, I will take care of this. And you can just go and sit and relax. So I took my, the tray up to my mom. And I told her what was happening. And he said, you're very much like your grandma. <laughs> I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> How did I become grandma all of a sudden? And he said, the way that you talk, and you speak with conviction, and almost like a, a sense of authority. But all I said, oh, mom doesn't eat that much. For me, it was nothing. But he said, you are very much like your grandma, your dad's mom. And I know of my dad's history that he did, was not loved by his grandma, or my grandma. And he always wanted to make his mother proud of him. And he thought he was helping me, but I guess somehow in his mind he thought he was helping his mom. And when I said, that's, not, that's too much, that he also felt inside of him that he felt uh, he had let his mother down, this little boy that I saw. And so it was my practice to be a child, his child, his daughter, and also to be the loving mother, the kind mother that my father never had. And that helped build the relationship and sort of like understanding where he was coming from in his moments of like, what's your problem? But no, but in his moments, I could react, choose to react. It's like, you're an adult and put this expectation, you're my dad, be my dad. But at that time, I understood from my own practice that, oh, I became grandma without even knowing. I never spent much time with my grandmother. Mm. But somehow I reminded my father of my grandma. And just that image of my father, I mean, uh, the brothers and sisters know him. <laughs> He's quite a character. But him just standing in the corner and with his head hung low and whispering in his mouth, you always tell me what to do. You can see the deep pain inside of him that he's held. and He didn't know how. So the guided meditation this morning is to help us to do that, to understand deeply without blaming him and without blaming ourselves and sort of embracing that and holding, holding that space for yourself and to recognizing what has been transmitted from generations to generations. Like I didn't know I was like my grandma. I didn't grow up with my grandma. Now, I didn't know that I was exactly like my grandma. She's awesome. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> just like I'm awesome, right? <laughs> but that's what it is, you know? We have so many uh, things that have been transmitted down to us. And and sometimes in this present moment, we think that we are that problem. We have this habit. And I don't want to like blame the, blame the past. Just say, oh, it's their fault. They gave this to me, and now I'm like this, considered who I am. And now I have to fix everything. But in fact, I don't think the sole teaching of 
awareness of suffering, the four immeasurable minds, is to blame suffering for anything. Our habit is anything that we like, we like to keep with us. And anything that we dislike, we try to eliminate it. And so when we have an emotional feeling, a negative seed arise inside of us, we do everything that we can to get rid of it. But I have bad news for you. It's going to be there. You can't really get rid of it. You can get rid of the idea of it, but it's still there. One time I had a conversation with uh, one of my younger Dahmer sisters, and she had said she had, was having difficulties in her practice. And she had asked me, like, doesn't the sisters, the elder sisters, not me, but other elder sisters, <laughs> Doesn't the elder sisters think that because I have so many difficulties that I need to be embraced? That I, I have problems and I need to be accepted and they need to help me and not push me away? And I said, why do you think that you have problems? I've never seen a situation where you have a strong emotion or a difficulty as a trouble or a problem. Because it's not. It's something that needs to be loved. It needs to have more attention. So this is why Taya said, when we recognize a negative feeling arising in us, we can hold it like a baby and smile to it. Embrace it. Offer it its comfort. Because more than anything else, our suffering needs it the most ourself, to offer that for ourselves, not to punish suffering, because that is our habit. I want to punish suffering. And sometimes, sometimes, I'm going to call you guys out for this, we use meditation to punish suffering by saying, breathing in, I'm calm, my suffering is not there, I'm going to relax my whole body, you know, letting go of all these emotions. And sometimes, if we're unskillful, the meditation practice can be a spiritual bypassing. And so the practice of being 100% is not to bypass that. It's that I'm present for whatever comes to me. And I can establish myself in my own body, in my footsteps, and be prepared to embrace what is instead of trying to breathe it away, breathe it away, but being there 100%, or for the beginners, 10%. <laughs> and that is how being 100% in our footsteps can help us to embrace ourselves, our suffering, our despair. It's not about uh, learning the text, learning the sutras and everything else, but really establishing a presence and not pushing anything away and holding that. And now I'm more aware of when I become my grandma. <laughs> and when I'm with my dad, I'm just like, good morning, daddy, to be that child, to allow myself, to allow myself to be a child of my father. Because I'm an adult. On top of that, I'm a nun. The pressure is high, right? And on top of that, I'm a Dharma teacher, too. So then that expectation that I have on myself that I need to be my best, that I'm always best on my practice. But I really just enjoy being my daughter, my father's daughter. And because I have the practice, I can embrace that little girl inside of me, and I can hold my father's little boy's hand and say, let's do this together. So we don't have to punish suffering, because suffering needs to be loved the most. So our practice is not to eliminate suffering. 
as an, an illusion. But our practice is to simply accept suffering as it is and to help suffering understand itself. It also means to help us understand ourselves. So let us listen to the sound of the bell. Somehow, this I think this is because I had a suggestion from Brother Fab Lu. But my father used to be a, a, a smoker, a smoker. And I guess it was for him a way to relieve stress. He is also a, a victim of the Vietnam War. He was also a soldier during the Vietnam War. In, in Vietnam, of course, for the American side. And he has suffered a lot, a lot of fear, a lot of pain, and what he's going through. So he used to smoke just to forget, or forget the things, because he didn't know how to process all of that. And my younger sister, didn't like him smoking because when you when you we go to school in the U.S. There's a smoking is bad. Dare to keep the kids off drugs. You remember that campaign, Dare. And and so we learned all of that. And then we learned smoking is bad. You're going to get cancer. And so then, but we are little kids. We didn't know better. And so then my sister, what she would do, she would take his cigarettes and hide them all the time. Every single day, she would just hide them like in this little corner somewhere, and she would just sort of pretend like she didn't do it. And uh, my dad got very mad at her. And one time, he spanked her, that you do not touch my cigarettes. And of course, my sister cried. And then, you know, we grew up, and then somehow, without even trying, when he saw my sister cry, he realized that he had hurt her. And so then he made a vow for himself that I'm going to quit smoking. Because it doesn't make him the person that he wants to be. He became a victim of his own suffering and he unintentionally transmitted it to his daughter. And uh, luckily for my father, he has, well, I don't know if it's luckily for him, but he has three daughters that became nuns. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a good sign or not, um, but I have two other sisters that ordained with Thai. And um, so he you know, eventually came to Plum Village, attended all of these retreats, and did his meditation as best as he could. And I think it was during a beginning a new session, and uh, Thai was teaching about beginning a new. And after that, my father was a bit fidgety. You know, that there's something really bothering him inside of him. And uh, he came to my sister. And he, he's, you know, Asian fathers don't really say, I love you. <laughs> they don't have a love language. They just say, here. <laughs> if they know you're there, that's their love language. Almost. Almost if they know that you're in the house, you know. If you, they know you're there, that's their love language. So my father came to my younger sister and he said, I needed to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And my sister was so nervous. Because like, what happened? Why did dad change? She never wants to talk to me. And she was so nervous. She was on a wreck, like really shaking. He said, I really need to talk to you. I need to get this done now. 
And then, so my sister didn't know what to do, so she just had to sit there. And my father mustered up the courage to say, I'm sorry. And my sister was like, what? He said, I'm sorry that I hit you for hiding my cigarettes. And I never told you, but I was so sorry. It took him 20 years to get that courage to say that. Because this is not easy. It's not easy. And so that my sister, it, it's awkward. In Asian families, we don't hug. It's not a thing. And we don't say, I love you. And then it was my mom, and my mom was there witnessing this. And then what happened was my mom was like, just hug already. <laughs> because it was so awkward, because we didn't know what to do. She didn't know what to say. And then my mom, just do it. And they're like, OK. <laughs> it was like, OK. And my dad was like, OK, that's enough. You know, like, <laughs> it irks him so much to get so emotional and say, ugh. But that was just a. A, a breakthrough for him to be able to communicate his pain and his suffering to his daughter. And sometimes as adults, we forget that. And we think, I'm supposed to know everything. I'm supposed to be OK. And we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable because we want to be a role model. And sometimes that may be a little bit toxic if we cannot model for our children how to communicate in a very constructive way. It took my father 20 years to apologize for something that, you know, we were being naughty, <laughs> hiding his cigarettes and trying to get that. But little did we know that we had transformed him very deeply. And even then, he, he had quit smoking for the longest time. After that incident, he never smoked again. And he has been clean for more than 30 years. And so that really woke something up in him. But he could not communicate, because he was so afraid of losing himself, losing the identity that he built of himself that I'm the father, I have this authority, I get to do what I want to do because I'm the adult in the house. And then if I say sorry, then what does that make me? I'm no longer a, a person of an authority or a teacher. My father is a man of little words, few words I'm sure most fathers are. Sit in front of the TV and just sort of grunt at every time you say something, yeah, sure when it's time to eat, to come eat. But maybe can we all tap into that? Tap into our father and then say, Daddy, I'm here for you. Daddy, I'm here for you. Because sometimes he may feel very alone. Now my father and I, we have a very good relationship. Mm -hmm. And nag him like, when they go out for a walk, he's like, no. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go out for a walk a little bit. And I would just try to get him to become more active. He's retired. And his whole life, he spent devoted to just taking care of his family. So the healing and transformation doesn't just happen over one night. It's not going to finish at the end of this retreat, and everything is going to be dandy. This is just the beginning, I'm warning you. It's just the beginning of a deeper transformation and healing. It took my father 20 years, 30 years, to say I'm sorry to my sister for something that had happened when she was five years old. And it, you know, we forgot about it. And when the one thing is that sometimes we don't forget this. We may forget the story, the details, the dates, or the time, but we don't forget the feeling. And I think that feeling sat with my father for so long. 
And so be 100% establishing ourselves gives us that energy to, so that we can come to face and embrace things that come to us, whether they are in our present moment or from our past. And that then will lay the foundation for how we will be in the future. So 100%, being 100% can heal now. And sometimes we have to be a little bit accepting of whether they are ready. We can't impose. I've never imposed my practice on my father and my mother. And I come home, they, they like to have the TV on, I'll sit and I have the meal with them. They can watch TV and uh, I'll just have and enjoy the meal. And there was one time mm, when I was living in France in Palm Village, I only got to visit my family every two years. And when Ty would come on the US tour and then uh, we would have, after the whole tour was completed, we'd have two weeks to visit family. And I never once said that you have to become vegan when I'm at home. Mm because my parents are not vegetarian, they're not vegan. They could be, um, but my father said, I don't want to have any meat while the sisters are here. And I never said that you have to, do I never did, but it was just that his respect for the life choice that I have and the transformation and the healing and the things that I do. And that's his way of saying, I love you. His way of saying, I love you, I recognize you, I see you. And how do I do that in return and not say, okay, now that we're vegetarian, we can turn off the TV, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, we probably all tried to do that with our family members at one point. Um, but yeah, just say, okay, let's go the middle way. I can, you practice eating vegetarian and I can practice eating with distraction and test my mindfulness, <laughs> my awareness and my wandering mind of all the things that happen in the world and what I consume. Mm. Yesterday, in the past couple of days, we've had a chance to really slow down, mm. almost real slow <laughs> and relax and to let go. And that's been mainly focused on the practice of the body. So now maybe we can slow down a little bit more in practicing slowing down our mind and to recognizing our mind and our feelings and our emotions. I, uh, I have a, another story um, related to the practice of 100%. You're we doing walking meditation in Upper Hamlet, and Tai was leading walking meditation. And I like to like linger in the back, just sort of watch everybody, observe what is happening. And then uh, I had a sister, and I said, did you see that? Because there was two sisters in front of me. They were walking and talking. And I asked the sister next to me, like, how much do you think they are investing in their footsteps and in their conversation? Because it was hilarious. They would stop, chit chat, and say something, take th two steps, laugh, stop and laugh, and then take two or three steps and then stop and laugh again. Like the whole conversation was stopping, it's almost like running, driving on the first gear on a stick shift. It's sort of like, and they didn't, they didn't go anywhere, and they, could, they didn't really uh, talk. Because while they were in between those intervals of stopping, they were actually thinking of what to say next in that whole conversation. I was like, I wonder how much are they investing in their thoughts, in their thinking, and their walking, and their talking. And we, I was just observing those two sisters with my other sister, and then after a moment, I couldn't take a walk, I couldn't take a step. And he said, I can't step yet because my mind is still talking and looking and thinking. And so then we stood there and the whole sangha had already left and I just stood there because my mind is still caught into those ideas. 
And it wasn't until I took a deep breath and I felt my feet on the floor, on the ground, and I said, I think I'm ready to walk now. So it's not an idea that I want to plant with you, oh, a robotic way of, okay, so Sir Kim Yim says no talking and walking, I'm just gonna freeze. And then as long as my mouth is not moving, I can move my, my feet. It's not about that. It's really about this whole conversation and how much I can bring my attention to, to my feet. So I stood there for 10 minutes until I said, I think I'm ready to walk now. I think I'm ready to invest 100%. I take nothing less than 100% in that investment. And so today, I have a gift for all of you. I, I didn't hand stamp 1,000 business cards, but I do have Vista print a 100% card for all of you to take home as a practice uh, offered by Thai in the community. And uh, you can keep this in your wallet. Or if you have your partner, you can just pull up. 100%. Are you here for me? I'm right. So I will leave this in the front of the stage here, and then you can pick one up uh, for yourself. Um, everyone, I have enough for everyone, I believe. And uh, this is a, a wonderful practice. It has the ability to bring us joy and happiness and healing and transformation because we put ourselves in one thing, in one thing only. They say the best kind of chocolate is the purest kind of chocolate is dark 100%, 80%, not mixed with anything else in there. Milk chocolate, it's for kids. <laughs> dark coffee for adults, yeah. <laughs> um, so anything 100% is always best. And sitting with your suffering 100% without trying to run away is the best way not to embark on a path of spiritual bypassing and to give us the illusion that we are healing and transforming. And the same can be applied to when practicing 100% with the earth. In the past couple of days, we've heard many texts uh, being read uh, from the book Love Letter to Mother Earth. And this is uh, a book from Thai. And we've, this is what we've been hearing and practicing. It's almost a theme of the retreat. Mm, we'll hopefully be able to make it through the whole book, through all of our practices. And it's a way to establish ourselves 100% for Mother Earth, to listen to her, not to try to eliminate the, the groups of people that make her suffer. Because Mother Earth, as we've heard in many in the past few days, that she's very inclusive. And we are all her children. And the last thing that she would ever want, or any mother would want, is for the children to fight. So this is not a fighting matter. It's a matter of we can listen deeply to our siblings. Mm. and listen deeply to the real pain of Mother Earth. The real pain of Mother Earth. Because not only, yes, that we are taking a lot of fossil fuels and, and global warming, everything, all of that is happening. But Mother Earth doesn't want us to fight one another. And there can be a dialogue. It's, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy because everybody's so stubborn. So stubborn. 
because we have our own views. But the most important is just seeing beyond that, beyond that story, and just look and see that five-year-old child, that sense of insecurity, mm. the sense of insecurity, that fear inside of us, and also the insecurity and the fear or the, you know, the craving for power and for money and fame of our fellow Earth citizens. And where does that come from? That sense of needing more. I'll hold back on that one. <laughs> um, I grew up uh, in, from in an immigrant family. My parents migrated from the from Vietnam to the U.S. And uh, I was born and raised in San Diego. And one of the things that I had to learn is that you know uh, that my parents put on a lot of pressure on me as a child. And, and they had expectations of how they wanted me to succeed. And I broke through all of that expectation. I'm sure being a nun was not anywhere <laughs> in their job descriptions or job, job fair for me. Um, it was either being a doctor, uh, being a lawyer, or being a nurse or an engineer. Mm. <laughs> I had always wanted to be a lawyer because why not make money with my mouth? I can argue my way through life. <laughs> right? Well, I'm, I'm also using my mouth now through life, but it's a different kind of argument. Yeah? But I can make money out of that. Using my mouth and just art fighting with people, I can do that. Uh, but yeah, so that was what I wanted to do. And um, yesterday, in my Dharma sharing, I, sh I said why all of a sudden I decided to drop everything to ordain as a nun. And it was because I lost the debate. I had to surrender to Thai. I was arguing with Thai throughout the whole Dharma talk and I completely lost. And he didn't know that. He absolutely didn't know. I was just sitting right there in front of him and everything that he said, I always had this resistance and argument, like, well, well what about this? <laughs> you know, like, well, you say that, and, and what about this? And I was just trying to beat my way through and to prove Tai wrong. But he didn't even have to have his business card to say I'm 100% right. But he, and I just said at the end of the retreat, I just said, I gave him, well, this is it. There's nothing left for me. Because what is most important now is what I have now. And because of my ideas of some sort, I can lose them. As a child, I always wanted to make a lot of money so that I can have, so that I can take care of my parents. I was chasing after a distant happiness, a distant dream. But I didn't recognize that my parents were right there, alive with me then. So I said, oh, I'll come back. I'll come back. I'll make money, and I'll come back. And then they can live a comfortable life, the one that I've always wanted for them, but not necessarily the one that they wanted for themselves. And what is it that they wanted for themselves? What kind of life did they want? They wanted a life where the children love each other and that the children also spend time with their parents. If I spent eight years in college and graduate school, I would not have had that time. I mean, it doesn't work that I left my home at 14 to France, to the other side of the world, and only came home every two years. So that they have sort of lost my, that I was not there physically for them. But as now I'm here, my mother won't let me go anywhere. <laughs> She's only 45 minutes from Deer Park Monastery. And uh, 
she's texting me every day, like, where are you? How come I haven't heard from you? Like, mom, I'm in a retreat. <laughs> but it's also that, that mother always wanting all of her kids to be together. And the same thing is with Mother Earth. She doesn't want us as siblings to punish one another for her sake, for her sake. But if we can come together and sit together, listen to one another, and not only listen to one another as a person on the outside, but really listen to that person on the inside, just like we did the guided meditation this morning of inviting, seeing my father as a five-year-old child. You can see your so-called opponent, brother or sister, the oil company or the gas company and all of that, as our brother and sister, and I call them up to see what kind of suffering that they can, that they are going through. So it's not necessarily having to be, this is an active activism in non-action activism by coming from a place in your own heart and knowing that you have enough capacity to embrace them as a person, as a human, as an earth citizen. And when we do have a chance for a dialogue or protest or to do real activism, we're doing from a space of understanding and love and not of punishment. because no one wants to be punished for their misunderstanding. And if we have that capacity inside of us, that presence inside of us, we can build that bridge that has been broken, the bridge of communication. There is a two-way street for communication, the one who speaks and the one who listens. Hmm. And it's not just everyone trying to speak. Speaking is not only the only way to communicate, but listening is also a way to communicate. And when somebody has spoken to their heart's consent, I think I've spoken to my heart consent now, then it will be your turn. So non-action non activism. It may look like we're just sitting on a cushion, Breathing and smiling and without a care in the world, but a lot is happening. And maybe that's just what we need is to do nothing. Not, you know, to do nothing. Because sometimes it causes more misunderstanding and hatred. And coming back to ourselves, allowing us that peace and that calm and that space so that every single action we do there on forward will be intentional in the space of understanding and not of reaction. Maybe we can listen to the sound of the bell. As a novice, um, I don't know if this has been explained to you, but as a novice, when I was growing up, I was taught that the practice of touching of the earth is very profound. It's not just lying in the child pose position in yoga until your feet gets numb, um, but it's really when we join our palm, mm, one hand represents our body, and one hand represents our mind. We bring them together, meaning we're establishing a presence, 100% of our presence right here. And we bring our hands up to our forehead, 
the third eye, and then over our heart. And then we open up our palms. And then we touch the earth, just like we've been doing. But I've been told the small detail is that you can just imagine taking all of your worries and your sorrow, anxiety from your mind, and all the weight that you're carrying in your heart, and you open it up, and you touch the earth. And just sort of imagine that you're pouring your whole heart onto the earth because, because earth is heart. It's from earth to heart. If you move the letter H to the front, it spells the word heart. That's where we're supposed to be. That's where our heart is supposed to be. We pour all of our heart onto the earth. And because we're standing, the distance is so far, and the communication is not there. And in that position, I can pour everything that is in my mind and everything that is in my heart. Because it's so much when you feel lost and confused. You feel you have no direction. That's what you can do. And the earth, her greatest quality is non-discrimination. If you pour water into the earth, she will absorb the water. If you pour milk into the earth or perfume into the earth, she will absorb the milk and perfume. She will hold it, transform it into beautiful flowers. If you urinate onto the earth or the elk, urinates into the earth or have bowel movements in the earth. She doesn't throw it back at us. I hope not. But she also absorbs the impurities. And it takes a little bit longer to hold. It takes a little bit longer to transform. But eventually it'll transform into beautiful flowers. And so as a novice, I was taught that anything, I have so much suffering in my heart, I can pour it onto the earth. And the earth will hold that suffering for me. And the earth will transform and heal it for me. And because now we are more aware that we are children of the earth, we can do the same. When we touch the earth, we can hear her pain and her suffering, and we can hold it for her. And we can hold it, transform it, and offer new flowers for her. But the wonderful thing is that she has so many children. And it's only one mother with so many children. If we all do that together, there's already healing on the earth. That we can collectively listen to her, collectively have an insight on how to go forth and embracing everyone and everything to be her true continuation. With each step that we take, each breath that we take is to generate that energy, that healing and transformation that the earth has transmitted to us, that ability to do that. And so uh, I hope during the next few days of the, the retreat, we continue to journey together as a multifold sangha to water the seeds of awareness, listening to the earth, starting by simply listening to ourselves, being present 100% in the here and now, and only because Today is today's day, and we can only do that today, right now and right here. We are all citizens of the present moment. Thank you. <laughs>